Hey everybody, I'm Lady. And I'm Alana. And this is Spookery. Uh, we're back. Episode 3, baby! Let's go! Man, has it been three weeks already? You know, it's kind of crazy. I It feels like it's been going on for longer, but at the same time, we haven't done enough. It's weird. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Uh, <laughs> I think all of the research kind of makes it feel longer, and also we've been talking about it for so long. So That's it's true. The concept of spookery was born quite a while ago. It sure was. It sure was. Uh, but we're back. It's my turn again. We are doing the category of WTF cases. What the fuck? Um, I got a good one for you, I think. I'm pretty proud of this one. Um, yeah, yeah. I've 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 had a I've had a chance to recharge my batteries. I've just come back from the the spookiest of vacations, literally Halloween uh, in Salem. Not to date the, the this uh, this recording, but I've just come back from that. Uh, and man, we have to go. We have to go next year. We're, it's booked. I I bought my ticket. We're going. All right, it's happening. Yes, I want to go on all the tours with you. I want to see all the ghosts with you. Uh, I was literally going around Salem, just like pointing at random buildings going, is it haunted? <laughs> is- Maybe we can do, you know, some special episodes next year, like specifically Salem themed around, you know, if, if we do a trip together. I'm kind of hoping that the spookery wheel is favorable to me and I get like haunted locations or something along the line so I could talk about Salem. Cause like I, I went with the intention of collecting stories and man, oh man, like, I filled out my spreadsheet with stories. There were so many cool Salem stories that people don't really know about because, like, it's the the witch trials is, like, the big thing. It's the 16, 1692, 1693. Everyone knows that. But then there were a whole, like, there's, like, Salem has so much history from then until now. And, like, nobody talks about it. And it's like, okay, all right. I got you, Salem. I got your number. I so. got you. Yeah, dive in, like you said, dive into those DMs and get the real scoop of what's going on. Yeah, I've befriended all of the historians. Um, I had a good chat with them. I stole their stories. I did, I didn't tell, uh, I, I can tell you this now. I went to the Ouija board museum in Salem. Oh. Because there is one. It's the only in-person museum, so they claim. Um, hmm. Actually, they're really cool. Like, if it's got, like, a bunch of, like, the old historic Ouija boards that I talked about in the last episode, uh, my last episode. And, like, it had, you know, the Oriel board, it had the, the classic before Ouija Ouija boards, it had the, the Barbie pink one was there. I was a little surprised it didn't have Cryptique. It didn't have the, the beautiful blue Salem limited edition one. So I was a little... That is unfortunate. Little I mean, it, it did have the Barbie one, so that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, I do have a question, though. When you say in, the only in-person one, do you mean, like, the other one, the other uh, Ouija board, I mean, things are, they're all for ghosts? Yes. A hundred percent. No. Uh, so the other Ouija board museum, the one that immediately comes to mind was one of my sources, which was the Talking Board Museum. And that's an entirely virtual museum. Oh. So they don't have an in-person location. It's only a virtual archive, kind of like the Spookery is a virtual archive. Um, I see. So they've collected Ouija boards and all the history of Ouija boards over the years, but it's all in a, in a virtual uh, sense. This one was the in-person one where they had physical boards and it was they were covering the walls and I, I mostly went uh, in there to double check make sure I got everything right and from what I <laughs> understood I got most everything right a couple of things were a little off but I also could be just like oral tradition like you know th- certain details change it was none of the really important details so I'm still satisfied with my episode hell yeah but really cool to visit I'm officially a weedologist that is just my life now I, I live in the, the throes of Ouija. Hasbro is still being weird. I'm on to you. And Travelers Insurance Company. Yes. Hasbro, Travelers Insurance Company, we're on to you. We know. Yeah. First two episodes already uncovered. Two conspiracy theories. Let's see what we uncover with this third episode. I don't know if I have a conspiracy theory this episode. I'm going to be honest. Uh, because my, my topic is what the fuck cases, I, I focused more on the cases themselves more than like what was happening around the time because like they're weird and, and we'll, we'll get into it but uh 
I don't know if I have a consp- like a company to add to my conspiracy. Theory. Maybe we'll uncover one later that I wasn't even aware of, but we'll, we'll, well, we'll get into it. Yeah, well, I'm excited nonetheless. Uh, like I said, I don't know anything about this one. Even seeing the title of this, I don't think I've ever heard of these, so... Oh, that makes me so I, happy, so... I am intrigued. All right, so... For, for those of you who did not read the title of this episode, I am covering the Erdington Murders, also known as the Erdington Coincidences. Um, it is... It, they're technically two separate murders. Uh, both of them happened in Erdington. They are not connected in any way. Um, but there is a vein of strangeness to them. Hmm. And we'll get into it. I'm really glad that you don't know this. Uh, you've never heard of the, the, the Erdington murders or the Erdington coincidence? No. The, ooh, no. Yeah. What a, what a name. I know, right? Like, I, in the, this, is a, this is a British set of murders. It's two murders. Uh, not connected in any way, shape, or form. They're not related to each other. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start there. I did actually think about um, how I was going to do this because this is a very, this is a very fun case, but it's also like you could, you know, give out, like hand out the key early and be like, like here, like this is, this is the twist, but now we're like really pay attention because the details get kind of weird. Or yeah. I could tell you the stories and kind of let it sink in slowly and then do the recap at the end. So I love it. I <laughs> so love I'm, I'm going to just get straight into the murders um, and then we'll do a debrief at the end, kind of going over what makes this so bizarre. Um, I'm here for it. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm going to start off quickly, though, with a trigger warning. We are going to touch upon sexual assault. Um, I will flag it when it comes up so you can skip ahead. But just know that it is part of these these cases, this case. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail, but just be aware that we do talk about sexual assault later on. Perfect. So, Alana, how do I like to start my stories? With context. I sure do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so We're going to get a whole big scoop of context right where we like it. Yes. Uh, my, my favorite uh, spice is context. So, well, let's get into some context. So, my context <laughs> is Erdington, which is, of course, the, the setting of my what the fuck case. Erdington is a suburb of Birmingham, England. It's three hours northwest of London in, in good traffic. I'm not going to claim that I've tried it any like recently, but <laughs> in good traffic, when I checked, it's about three hours northwest of London. Um, I'll, I'll trust you on that. Yeah, please do. Please, please trust me. Uh, <laughs> um, all of my, from all of my research, it's a very ordinary English town. It's, it's very ordinary. It has a population of 23,000 people as of 2001. Um, most residents are Christian, um, though there is a rising population of agnostic and atheist residents. Very, like I said, very standard. Um, here's a random note, random side note, because I love those. Uh, Erdington appears in something called the Doomsday Book. Oh. It's spelled Domesday, D-O-M-E-S-D-A-Y, but it's pronounced Doomsday. Uh. That doesn't sound good. (laughs) Well, uh. The, the Doomsday Book was originally called the Book of Winchester, and it was actually a ledger of William the Conqueror. And oh. it was how Old Willie used to log all of the lands and holdings that belonged to him. So when he conquered, he was like, that's mine. That's mine. Um, so he would log it in this book, and it was called the Doomsday Book because whatever he wrote in this book, it was you couldn't change it. Uh, oh. It was unalterable, and it was could not be challenged, so... It was called the Doomsday Book. All right. Nothing to do with the end of the world. It's just what it was called. Uh, so back to Erdington. Oh. Yes, did you want to say something? I accept. I accept it. All right. <laughs> I don't want to be in the book, but I accept it. All right. Yeah, well, if you are in the book, it means you belong to William the Conqueror. I don't think anybody wants that. No, I don't want to. No. Um, yeah. So Erdington is currently conservative. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's two main British parties, the Conservative and Labour. Uh, so the Erdington is currently conservative from what I could see um, and it is actually the home of a couple of famous people we love that mm-hmm. uh, so it's uh, the original hometown of footballers Paul Devlin Ronnie Bird and Mike Kenny oh my gosh these are British footballers not soccer players like you're, oh. you're soccer players but British footballers 
Yeah, uh, I know them just the same. <laughs> not, makes, not at all. <laughs> makes no difference. Uh, it's also hometown to musical talents Jeff Lynne of ELO, mm. uh, John Lodge and Mike Pinder of Moody Blues. Moody Blues? I've never heard of them, but I'm sure they're great. Yeah. Uh, most notably, it's the hometown of John Oliver from Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's neato. He's from Rudington. So, wow. So I bet he's heard of this. Uh, you know, I would not be surprised... Uh, if he had, because it's it's quite it's quite the the, the tarnish on on Erdington's reputation. It's a it's a, it's a very standard town. Like even American towns are like this. Like they're they're very sleepy. You know, nothing bad happens in these towns. They're just it's just a very standard, very ordinary town. Yeah, like, nothing happens. Like bad things, until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be talking about Erdington if nothing bad happened. Um. So, what makes Erdington special, though, is that it has this legacy. It has, um, it has, uh, it has like a, a scar upon it, I guess, and it's in the form of the Erdington murder, or Erdington murders, or Erdington coincidences. So, okay. uh, like I said, Erdington murders are two separate murders. Uh, they both took place in Erdington, and they're not connected. They are not related to each other. Um, so, I'm going to talk about the first one right now which is the murder of Mary Ashford. So, okay. uh, our first murder happened in 1817, uh, which means information was so hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like 1800 murders, I guess. Um, I will actually save this for both. Information about the victims for uh, both murders, incredibly difficult to come by, and it's actually harder for me to find information on the other one. This is actually the one I could find the most information. Um, certain information is also twisted in some of my sources, so I did my best to try and figure out which one was the truth. I actually found uh, the old court records from 1817, so that helped me kind of get my information in line, but like I said, there's not a lot that I know about the victims, which is such a shame. Um, I think it, it's, what kind of happened is that the victims kind of got swept up in like the what-the-fuck nature of these cases, so I've done my best to try and piece together what of what I could find of their lives, but there's just not a lot of information. Yeah. Cool. So, Mary Ashford, born December 31st, 1796. She was a heckin' Capricorn. I just, I have a say. <laughs> we start the story with the Capricorn. I always gotta start my story with the Capricorn. Context in Capricorn. That's, that's the truth. <laughs> uh, she was the daughter of Thomas Ashford and Anne Ashford, and she had seven siblings. Big family. Wow. She had four right. brothers and three sisters, and her most notable siblings are her older brother and sister named William and Anne. Uh, she was a devout Christian. Uh, you know, that, as most people in Erdington were at the time. Um, mm -hmm. She was also a domestic servant and a housekeeper to her uncle, John Coleman, I'm going to guess on her mother's side. Uh, and he was a farmer at a, at a, at a place called Langley Heath. Um, mm. Her Sounds father. Lovely. Yes. Just gorgeous, beautiful place. Uh, her father was also local, uh, and he worked as a gardener in Erdington. But she was currently under employ of her uncle, and she kind of would run errands. You know, she would take things to market. Um, she would clean his house. You know, she was kind of like, you know, she was the, the errand girl kind of thing. Okay. Um, so, our story takes place on May 26th, 1817, which was a religious holiday called Whit Monday, which I didn't know was a religious holiday. Uh, but it's it's kind of, it fluctuates with Easter, so it, it the holiday changes uh, every year. But on this particular year in 1817, it landed on May 26th. Okay. So Mary left work at about 6 p.m. to visit her friend Hannah Cox. Okay. The two had made plans that night to hit the town, you know, go dancing, go go see the sights, have a party. They were going to go celebrate because it was a holiday. Is that what you do on Easter? Uh, well, this is not Easter. This is Whit Monday. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Is that like you're celebrating Easter's over, basically? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that holiday sucked. It's Whit Monday. So Easter <laughs> happens. Easter happens like a month before, and then like a month later, then oh. it's Whit Monday. And I well, think Easter happens on a Sunday, and then you said this was a Monday, so I imagined it was the day after. No, no, no. This is it's well, quite that was confusing. It was quite it's quite some time. I think Easter happens in April usually. This is in May. Uh, oh, that's true. Okay, I don't know when Easter is. Apparently. Yeah. So. On this particular religious holiday, Mary goes to hang out with her friend Hannah Cox. Uh, they made the plans that night to go dancing, and they were actually going to go up to a very specific local dance hall called the Three Tons. Hmm. Uh, 
Tuns, T-U-N-S. Oh, okay. It's now called the Tyburn House, and it still stands today. It is a pub. Oh, I yeah. want to go. There you go. Yeah, go to, go to the Tyburn. Yeah, I don't know if they do dancing, but I uh, but I know that they what? serve good food. And because this was like a, well, it's a religious holiday, so like your your point is to like eat and ma- and and be merry. So like it it was still a pub back then, but it was also it had like a dance hall section. Now I think it's just a pub. I'm getting a lot of mixed signals. I don't know. I don't I don't know what to tell you. I haven't been to Erdington. I can only tell you what I see. Uh, and this was in 1817. I don't know what's what. All right. Well, continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what's worth noting here, um, earlier in that week, Mary, uh, Hannah's mother actually, uh, reported that Mary had said that she had a bad feeling about the week to come. Hmm. So, very, very ominous. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, so, Mary goes to the Cox's house at 6 p.m., they get all dressed up, and it is actually noted that Mary had, uh, bought brand new shoes for the event, she was going out in a beautiful brand new dress and she was wearing a straw bonnet. Oh. Um, they ap- reportedly arrived around Tyburn House at 7.30 p.m. And the party was in full swing. Ooh. Yeah, like, they they were late to the party. They, they, things were already getting studied. That's, you show up fashionably late. You want to start, you want to get there when things have already, like, gotten into things. You don't want to be the first one there. Right. No one wants to be the first one on the dance floor. Oh, my, can you imagine? You show up to the dance hall, like, you're the only one there, and you're like, well, I'm going to cut a rug. It's fine. <laughs> no, you get there, all the other girls on the dance floor are already sweaty, their hair is frizzy, and you get there looking like a snack. You know, you, She's going to clean up. Oh, let me tell you. She, know, she, she knew what she was doing. Let me tell you, Mary was a snack. She was, <laughs> she was looking fab this evening and it's actually reported that she, uh, she was kind of the belle of the town she was gorgeous um, she looked great in her new dress and her straw bonnet and she was seen dancing with a variety of suitors uh, it was later in the evening they actually began conversing with two men in particular one named Benjamin Carter and the other was called Abraham Thornton I don't trust him fair <laughs> I, you, you should not uh, so at midnight the four left together they left Tyburn House and they were going along the path. Benjamin and Hannah split up with Mary and Abraham. So there were a couple of my sources that said that Benjamin returned to, to the dance hall, but the actual court record stated that he just went home. And I was like, wow, like Benjamin either like kept the party going past midnight or he went home. One of the two. Uh, one of the two. But the court records indicate that he went straight home. So I'm going to say he went straight home. Okay. Hannah also went straight back home. And Mary announced that she would be going to her grandfather's house that evening because it was closer to work, which was true. Hmm. Hannah did note, however, that Mary would need to come back to Erdington to pick up her work clothes anyway because she had gotten dressed at Hannah's house. So, like, it wouldn't have mattered. She could have, like, she was going to go. She had to come back to Hannah's house anyway to pick up her clothes. Yeah, her plan made no sense. She kind of made a note that she was like, all right, Mary, like, get it, but, like, be safe. Yeah. Um... So Mary and Thornton departed in the direction of Mary's grandfather's house. Mm. At 2.45 a.m., Thornton was seen leaving a friend's house with a woman in tow who kept her head down and hidden. And this was specifically, like, mentioned, like, she was deliberately trying to hide her face, so it's not known if this was Mary. But I think it's safe to say that it probably was, and she just, you know, did want to be seen that she was partying out at nearly 3 a.m. Yeah, she's a good girl. She's, people would know. They would talk. Yeah, she's she's devoutly religious as well. Like it's it's a it's a celebra- it's a holiday, yes, but it's you know it's a religious community, and like nothing good happens after two a.m. So like she's got you know, she's got things to do. Yeah, things to do or people to do. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> she, anyway, <laughs> moving swiftly on. Yes. So at four a.m. on May twenty seventh, the day after, the Tuesday. Hannah was awoken by Mary, who had spoke by to change her clothes. So she came back to Hannah's house anyway. Oh, thank God, she's fine. Yeah. Hannah is naturally like, what the fuck, Mary? It's 4 a.m. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, and she noted that Mary appeared in a pleasant mood and had spent time with Thornton before the two had parted ways. Mm. Uh, so, you know, of course, they're, they're getting like, Hannah's like, what, what's up? But also like, are you safe? Are you good? And she's like, yeah, I'm totally fine. Uh, Mary also then, uh, sorry, Mary began her walk home promptly about that um and a lot of witnesses saw her on the road just a little after 4 a.m so she arrived just before 4 a.m and she left right after 4 a.m so it was a pretty quick turnover yeah um and witnesses reported that she was traveling alone okay some of the witnesses that saw her between the hours of 3 30 and 4 30 a.m they all said they saw her alone but they also noted that she was walking quickly Hmm. so 
that either could be that she was nervous or she was just trying to get to work, but it was noted that she was walking quickly. So yeah. do with that what you will. Okay. So it's 6.30 a.m. on May 27th, 1817. A local laborer was on his way to work, and he was walking through an area which will later be called Pipe Hayes Park. But at this moment, it's currently just a field in Erdington. Uh, but he's on his way to work. All right. As he's kind of going through this field, he stumbles upon a bundle of clothing, a straw bonnet, and a pair of bloody shoes oh, next no. to a flooded sand pit. No. Yeah. So, naturally, when you stumble upon a bundle of clothes and bloody shoes, you're like, whoa, I am not qualified for this. I need to, I need to get help. Mm-hmm. So, he, he ran down through the field, and he began knocking on the doors of the, the people who lived in this area. It was called Chester Road. He's knocking on the doors. He's like, call the police. There's been a terrible accident. Um, they alerted the police, and, and he, you know, he went on with his way. They eventually dragged the bottom of this flooded sandpit, and the body of Mary Ashford was found submerged in the dirty water. She was 500 yards away from her home. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Right? Poor girl. So, there were two sets of muddy footprints in the area around the body. One believed was belonged, uh, belonged to a man, and the other a woman leading up to the pool. And then the, men's, the man's footprints uh, departed alone and disappeared. Hmm. Uh, Mary's arms were covered in bruises. Uh, they believed defensive in nature. And trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning, please skip ahead. Uh, she had been raped and strangled. So she was raped first, and then she was strangled. Uh, her cause of death was found to be drowning. Oh. So she had been attacked, <clears throat> strangled, and left for dead, but she was left for dead in this flooded sand pit, face down, submerged in the water. Uh, and it was it was later found that she had died of drowning, and it was actually a uh, a work of very early forensic work. Um, it was like a later they had done like a quick autopsy, and they found duckweed in her stomach, which led uh-huh. them to believe that she she had drowned. Interesting. I was going to say this was like you said, eighteen seventeen. Like this, yes, this, this is early. So like, yeah. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Oh yeah. This was this was way back. This was not like they didn't have DNA. They didn't have forensic. They didn't have ways to like save the footprints. Like, yeah, this is like early, early stuff. So the fact that you know they they figured out that she had drowned because they have the contents in her stomach. It's really impressive. It is That's so good on you. Yeah. Hmm. Um, it was also speculated by the way that the footprints were around the sound pit that her attacker had waited for her in the fields like, in hiding, and then he had snuck up behind her before attacking. That was kind of the message that the footprints had given her. Gotcha. So, by 8 a.m., Abraham Thornton was in handcuffs and accused of murder. Oh, wow. Yeah. They didn't, they wasted no time. They found the body at, at uh, 6.30, uh, yeah, 6.30 in the morning, 8.30, there's our 8 a.m., Thornton was in handcuffs, and he had been carted off to Warwick Jail. Interesting. So let's talk about Thornton for a bit. Yeah. Because... I need to know more about this gentleman. This gentleman, this man, this Abraham Thornton. So, he was born in 1793, so that would make him about 24 at the time of the murder. So he would have been four years older than Mary. Okay. Uh, He was the son of a construction worker slash bricklayer. Um, And it was said that he dabbled in construction. It didn't say that was what he did, but he helped his dad from time to time. Uh, But he worked as a farmhand, primarily. Okay. Uh, He was described as heavy set, and both as a well-looking fellow and of repulsive appearance. So he's somewhere between, he looks okay, to whoa. So you either, like, loved him or you hated him. He was a very, like, specific taste. I think I think it was part of his personality reflected on that. Like, if you just saw him, you were like, yeah, he's an average-looking guy. But, like, when you, like, got to know him, you are like, oh, you're not necessarily a nice guy, are you? So what did Mary see so, in the schlup? Well, we don't know. She's not, she's not here to tell her story, unfortunately. That's fair. Yeah. Well, so maybe that was the problem. Yeah, maybe. And it, and it's possible that she didn't see anything in him and like we'll 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 talk about that in just a just a sec. Okay. So, uh a couple of onlook at the at the time of the dance, um a couple of onlookers and witnesses said that when he saw Mary at the dance that night, um he had leaned into this onlooker and asked her who she was. The onlooker claimed that uh he told us, like, that's Mary Ashford, you know, Bella Verdington, beautiful girl. And then as soon as 
uh, Thornton heard this, he started boasting that he had been intimate with his uh, with her sister three times, and he would be intimate with Mary or die for it. What? Thornton had claimed that he had been intimate with Mary's sister <coughs> Anne, her older sister, three times before, and he was like, you know, like I'm a I'm a big deal around that that Ashford family, so I'm definitely gonna be with Mary. Mm, okay, you know what a, just, what a chad, right? Just what what a, what a lad, you know, just. Anyway, uh, Thornton later denied these claims, uh, and the claims were also proven to be untrue, and was like, who the fuck is this? Wow. I've never heard of this man. <laughs> so he's just a weirdo. So, so yeah, he was boasting about something that didn't happen, and he also later denied that he said that. Classic Benjamin. Yeah, no, that's not Benjamin, this is Abraham Thornton. Oh, yes, so sorry, classic Abraham. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's ben- classic Benjamin, but Abraham's just doing it, it's weird. Yeah, ben- Benjamin was there, he was just like, I like Hannah, she's great. Yeah. <laughs> um... He was observed to be, uh, Thornton was observed to be very attentive to Mary, so she appeared to enjoy his company, he was very doting, you know, he, was, he paid a lot of attention to her, you know, complimented her, danced with her, uh, so she didn't, from, from what people said, they didn't appear, she didn't appear repulsed by him, like, they just seemed like they were having fun. I mean, like, I guess, but like, she just wasn't running away screaming. They, and they also left the dance together, so this is the like, thing to remember, they left the dance together, um, but Mary's friend Hannah later said that Thornton did not walk with them, but rather behind them, as if he was following. That's strange. Yeah. Okay. So, of course, Hannah and Benjamin go off home in their separate directions. Uh, in some of my sources, it said that Hannah and Benjamin actually, like, hung out on a bridge for a little bit before going home. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I couldn't find, like, what their relationship was. Like, they might have known each other, they might have been dating, or they might have met that night. Uh, the, the important part is that the two of them went off and Mary and Thornton went off together. Uh, so. What a good friend. You know, but yeah. this guy, this kid's just, this weird kid's just following us. I'm just going to go off with this other boy, though. You're good, though, right? Okay, bye. <laughs> but I'm also like, you know, like, they're young. They're 20 years old. Uh, and, you know, like, if Mary is going like, oh, yeah, I'm absolutely going back to my grandfather's house. Like, the girl goes like, okay, well, if she wants to get it. Like, she's young. She can do what she wants. Like, yeah. If she, if, like, I'm not, you're not her babysitter, you know? You, you kind of hope that she's got to look out for her. She wasn't drunk. She wasn't, like, you know, she wasn't under the influence of anything. She was just having fun. She was having a, a fun night. Yeah. So, uh, Mary and Thornton went off together, and he claims at about 2.30 in the morning, he and Mary had consensual sex in the field. Hmm. Uh, they claimed that they did some stargazing, and then he walked her to Cox's house to pick up her clothes. Hmm. So this is, this is Thornton's story. Um... He dropped her off at, at Cox's house, but according to Thornton, no matter how long he waited, she didn't come out. So he was kind of like, he became this jilted lover, he felt chastened, and he was tired, it was like you know, four in the morning, so he went home alone. Hmm. Now, now remember, Mary was not in Hannah's house for very long. She you know, went in right before 4 a.m. and left just after 4 a.m. Like, it was a very quick turnaround, so... Yeah. You know, do, do with that what you will. Hmm. Um... So when Thornton was arrested, uh, upon his arrest, he told the police, I cannot believe she is murdered. Why, I was with her until four o'clock in this morning. And they were like, that's crazy, because that's around the time she died. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Huh. Uh, Yeah. So after the arrest, he was stripped and searched, because, you know, they're like, "Hmm, maybe he's got a weapon on him. Like, he was arrested that morning, so, you know, he didn't have a lot of time to do a turnaround. Um... So his shoes were confiscated and blood was found on his undergarments. This is ain't looking for you. Yeah. His shoes were compared to the prints at the scene. Um, they, this is another uh, part of early forensics. They, they couldn't, like, they didn't know how to cast these footprints. They actually covered the footprints with a board um, to protect them from the elements. Okay. And then they compared them that way and they, uh, you know, they, they compared it with the, yeah, they compared it with the money footprints at the scene. Uh, and Thornton's shoe actually had a nail lodged into the sole of his shoe. Oh. And they were proven to be a match. Oh my gosh. It's not looking good. Right. It's not looking so good. Just they go throw him in jail immediately. Well, they did. <laughs> they arrested him. They, they took him at 8.30 and he was like, into jail with you. Yeah, good. So, August 8th. So this is like a month later. August 8th, 1817. At this point, the public was convinced that Thornton was their guy. Yeah. Like, it had, it had spread through Erdington. There was, like, the shoes match. He had blood on his undergarments. Like, this man is guilty. Yeah. It was, like, it actually got to a point where um, they were struggling to find jury members 
because like the whole pool was like tainted. Yeah, after after word spreads, it's hard to kind of get past that bias. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Small town, everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Six a.m. that morning, there was actually a huge crowd forming just to get access to the courthouse, and the crowds were actually so overwhelming it delayed the start of the the start of the trial. Oh my gosh. Because, like, people were just trying to get in, and it was like, they couldn't tell who needed to be there, so they were like, is everybody here? We're not sure, but people are still trying to get in. It was, it, was, it, it got a little, it got a little silly. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were also huge campaigns between uh, May 27th and August 8th. They were actually, like, spreading flyers, they were, like, word of mouth was spreading, so, yeah, well, like I said, it was really, really hard to find an unbiased jury. Like, Town of Erdington was like, he did it, let's yeah, get him. Yeah, let's fucking get him, boys. Lock him up. Yes. So, during the trial, Thornton painted this very weepy story. Uh, and it was all about, like, how he was he was absolutely enamored with Mary, and he do- lovingly doted on her all evening. And he escorted her, and he never took his eyes off of her. And, like, and he, and he, and he extended her night because she just wanted to keep partying after midnight. And he took her to all these beautiful places, and they hung out. And, and, they, and they, you know, she was so enamored with him, they had these relations in the field and watched the stars together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was like, she's the one. My heart, it burns for her. It's like, she was, she was my everything. And, and lo and behold, she jilted me when I took her to her friend's home, 4 a.m. Anyway, yeah, it was this big sob story about, you know, like, oh, he went, dropped her off at Mary's house, but then he began to believe that Mary had just been playing with his heart. And he was the victim that she, he had, he had been, he had been made a fool of, and they, and she had taken, like, his chastity from him. Wow. And, yeah, it was, it was quite a, it was quite a sob story that he he wove. Thornton. Uh, Thornton. Thornton. Yeah, and it, according to, to Thornton, he dejectedly left her at Hannah's house, and he was only informed that something bad had happened when the police knocked on his door at eight that morning. Yeah, that sounds super convincing. Yeah, unfortunately. There were plenty of witnesses to back up Thornton's claims. I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. So one witness was a milkman, and he claimed you saw Thornton at 4.30, two miles from the scene of the crime. So the crime kind of happened between 4.30 and 6.30. It was in that window that this happened. Mm -hmm. So already people are saying that they saw Thornton at 4.30, two miles from the scene of the crime. At 4.50 a.m., Thornton was seen by a gameskeeper in Castle Bromwich, where he had actually stopped for a, a chat for, like, a whole 15 minutes, and they were like, oh, yeah, you know, I was just at this party, it was, you know, it was a religious holiday, I had a great time, met up with this girl, she was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, and then they parted ways. So, he's been accounted for for at least that amount of time. Uh, the defense stated that for Thornton to have to, uh, if Thornton had had the opportunity to kill Mary, he'd have to chase her down, attack her, then travel three miles in no less than 11 minutes, which, you know, this was the 1800s. That's quite a task. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have cars. They didn't, you know, there wasn't like a, a local horse. Like, yeah, it was quite, I mean, it's not impossible, but it was, you know, it was quite the ass. Hey, I know how bad my mile times are. This guy would have to be pretty fast. Yes. So the judge was a man named Sir George Sowley Holroyd. Whoa, what a name. Yeah. Uh, so after uh, Thornton had given his, you know, his very weepy speech and Hannah had spoken, they actually got Benjamin to speak for a little bit. And he was like, you know, I didn't see much. I went to the dance and I went home. Yeah. Uh, so he took two whole hours to sum up the case after everyone had made their made their speeches. Wow. OK. Yeah. And he urged the jury to only rule on the specific charges, which uh, there were two charges for, uh, for murder. Yeah, it was a um, assault and murder, uh, and he had they, and the jury had to forget any implied malice, like they couldn't go on any speculation. Yeah, it's uh, a fair request, but uh. yeah, no, I'm, just just wait. He also stated that Thornton was behaving very honestly, and he had no reason to lie. What? what? Yeah, this is what the judge said. He had no, like, he had no reason to lie. He also boldly announced during his sum-up that he didn't believe Thornton committed the crime. Wow. Yeah. And once again, uh, making note of Thornton's appearance, he claimed that Thornton didn't look like the man who could run. Oh. Okay. Yeah. His final note to the jury was, it's better for a murderer to go free than an innocent man be convicted. Well, 
I'm really glad that this man was a judge. He picked the right career. Oh, yeah. No, the judges at Erdington were, they were quite special. That is that is quite the hot take. That is, that's, you know, like, that's, that's a choice, I guess. It's better that a million murderers go free than one innocent man get locked up. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I might have added some stuff there, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, if it wasn't Thornton, who the heck is it? Well, hold on. We haven't even gotten to the to the verdict yet. Well, uh, yeah, I guess true. I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know how the jury's going to vote on this one, actually. I mean, I'd be pretty, like, swayed if a judge is like, yeah, I think he didn't do it. I'd be like, okay, well, like, okay, I mean, like, you're a pretty trustworthy guy, I'd hope. I think that's, like, the problem. With, like, because this is not the only case of this where, like, a judge has been like, guys, guys. <laughs> it wasn't him. And it's just like, I don't think you can do that as a judge, can you? I don't think you can be like, jury, it's not him. Don't vote don't vote for him. I don't know if that's a thing you can do anymore. I think it's kind of almost ironic, too, for him to just be like, hey, don't listen to any other biases. Listen to me. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't don't think about, like, how weird he is and how much he can't run. Just look how honest he is. Look, look at that face. That face wouldn't lie. Yeah. 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 I was, like, looking around for a face as if one was going to pop up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you can kind of imagine how that went. So he concluded his lovely two-hour uh, debrief, and the jury conferred for six minutes. A whole whopping six minutes. A whole whopping six minutes, and they came back with the verdict. But what, unanimous? Unanimous. Not guilty. Wow. Yeah. The public was shook. I'm shook. Yeah, I mean, like, can you like it? Like, as a as a casual bystander, when you just I know it's all like mostly circumstantial evidence. Like, the biggest thing that's going for him is his footprints. But he also said that he was with Mary, so like, it's not uncommon that they were walking through the fields. He even said that they like had sex in the field. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know, but didn't. But, uh, I don't know, but who else could have done it? Well, see, we're, Thornton's not done. Wait, who? Yeah, we're not done with Thornton yet. Well, oh. Yeah, so there was actually a faction that rose up to get a retrial. Who? They were like, a faction? A faction rose up. Wow. The, the people of Erdington were like, that is unacceptable. That's impressive. Uh, and the head of the faction, no surprise, was Mary's brother, William. Okay. He was like, "That's that ain't gonna fly. That was like an embarrassment of a trial. Like, no. Like, how dare you call yourself a judge? Right, and this was actually before double jeopardy was a thing. Like, I mean, he was he was officially acquitted. Like, if in modern times, like that would be it. Like, he was he was declared not guilty. He couldn't be retried. But back then, back in eighteen seventeen, that was like it was totally fine to do that. They were like, I didn't like that trial. Do it again. That's cool. Well, not really, but I mean, well, also, is double jeopardy a thing in the UK? Yeah, I didn't know. I yeah. thought that was just a, like a US law thing. That's I'm a, pretty that's, sure. a, that's a national like. I mean, the back then, I've got it in my notes. So there's a law specifically in place saying that a family member could reaccuse. So if a family member didn't like how the trial went of the victim, specifically, a family member of the victim could reaccuse. Okay. Um, it wasn't just any member of the public, but it had to be a specifically a family member of the, the victim. And that law was changed two years later. Mm. Uh, so I, I, like, I'm pretty sure double jeopardy is a thing. I don't believe it's not. I've always grown up with double jeopardy, so all the times that I've been accused. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Very common, please. Yeah, you know, it happens. Well, um, yeah, so naturally, this this faction, they sent out uh, articles to a variety of newspapers. They handed out flyers and they were demanding a retrial because this was like a severe miscarriage of justice. They were like, no. Yeah. That, like, there's no way. There's no way that that, that, that was just going to happen. Yeah, how uh, do you have the suspect just walk out the door? Yeah, like like he was found with blood on his in his undergarments. Like his shoes matched. Like he was with her the whole night, and he just and the judge was like, "No, nah, it wasn't him. He, he doesn't look like he could lie." Yeah, you see him. That guy can't run. No, he can't run. He's he not running. He, he can't. Case he solved. Can't, he can't run. He can't run. Did they even have him run? That that would have solved the whole thing. They could have just had this guy run. <laughs> I do not believe they asked him to run. This is uh, this bad judge. Bad judge. No, Slap just, him on the wrist. Oh, we're not even. We're not even done. Hold oh, on. Oh God, does he get worse? Hold on. It gets worse. Oh, uh, so, so this faction, they appealed and they appealed. And so uh, a retrial was granted. They were like, you know what? That was a bit of a mess. Let's do it again. Uh, so on November 17th. So this is many, many months later. The first one was in August. This is in November. So November 17th, Thornton was brought back before the court. Uh, the bizarre twist of this retrial occurred, however, when he, they asked for his plea. They were like, hey, Thornton. We're back at it again. You know the drill. 
how do you plea? And Thornton looked at the at the jury and the judge, and he was like, not guilty! And I am ready to defend the same with my body! What? Yeah. He then donned a pair of leather gloves, took one off, raised it above his head, and then he threw it at the feet of William Ashford. Uh, what? He challenged William to a duel! What? Yeah. What? Trial by motherfucking combat. Is that a thing you can that do? Is, it was. At, in 1817, this was a thing you could do. Trial by combat? It was not a thing that people wanted to happen. They were like, that's kind of weird, but it was very legal. What? You, you could do it. Uh. So, yeah, so the terms were very simple. If Thornton won the duel, he would be acquitted and he would be found not guilty. What is that so? If, if I lost, can beat you in a duel, what? Yeah. If he lost, however, he would be carted off to jail with the verdict of guilty. And this he challenged Mary's brother, William Ashford, to this duel. I hate this. Right? They just have to honor this request? No. William did not accept this duel. Okay, good. Uh, William and his lawyer kind of looked at each other and were like, what? Like, what the fuck? Yeah, how do you not laugh at that? Like, you'd be like, haha, okay, cause, like, judge, let's uh, get chop chop trial. <laughs> yeah, they're like, we gotta get on with this. Uh, William and his lawyer actually claimed that they wouldn't allow William to become a catalyst of justice for his sister Mary. They didn't want it, like, it all to come down to, like, William's, like, efforts to fight Thornton. Yeah. Um, but he also said that he wasn't willing to do it because it would just be giving Thornton an opportunity to murder him. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up. I mean, like, both, both good points. I agree with William. Yeah. Yeah, William is like, I've literally been campaigning against this man for months. Like, he knows I don't like him. He's gonna kill me. Yeah, why would I want to fight the murderer? Yeah, he's like, he's gonna, like, literally commit the murder again on me. And the judge responded, let's not call this murder. <laughs> it's perfectly legal to duel one another. Wow. Yeah, the judge this, was like, I'm gonna... Ju <laughs> it's a different judge. Weirdly enough, there's a different judge. Oh my god! Yeah, and he was like, I'm actually kind of into this. I want to see where this goes. Like, <laughs> I... <laughs> I will allow it. And everyone was like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh my god. This bored judge is just like, yeah, go on. Yeah, it's like, I, I, it was it was kind of a boring Tuesday. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And the, William and, and the, 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 the prosecution are just like, what? What? So what, what do they do? <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the retrial did not go as planned for the Ashford family. Uh, and between the denial of the duel and the judges being weirdly sympathetic to Thornton again, they were like, he doesn't look like he can run. He's like, yeah. he's, you know, look at that guy. He's, like, he's ready He's ready to throw down and duel you, but he can't run. No, definitely not. Run. No. Uh, Dueling and the, running the, two different skills. Pretty much. Uh, so it was actually a panel of five judges for this retrial, and oh all five God. of them ruled. Yeah, they were all just like, this is fine. <laughs> I accept this. <laughs> so the five of them kind of looked at each other, and they ruled that there simply wasn't enough evidence to convict Thornton. There wasn't enough. There was no substantial evidence. They had a lot of um, circumstantial, but there was nothing that would really, like, it really pointed to him. Oh, except, like, the fact that he was there? Well, except the fact that he could have been there, but he was also possibly three miles away talking to a, to a, a milkman. Yeah, but so. that, who, how reliable was that milkman? I don't I didn't get a lot of information on that milkman. I don't trust him. You know. Is he as reliable as this judge? Because <laughs> <laughs> these judges are they're doing something. They're smoking something. Ugh, this town. Uh, like. Right. Anyway, Abraham Thornton was officially declared not guilty again. Again. And he was released. <sighs> don't stress, though. You win this time. You win this time, Thornton. Don't, don't stress. He did not get away that easy. Good. And this was really unfortunate. If he wasn't... If he wasn't the killer, this is really unfortunate for him, but the town was still convinced. Everyone was convinced except these judges. Yeah. So, after the trial, uh, he was hounded by the people of Erdington, and he was run out of town. Oh my gosh. Yeah. He fled to his um, his hometown of um, Castle Bromwich, uh, and they were like, we don't want you. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're good. So, he made a decision that he was like, us, ah, you know, the UK, England knows who I am. I'm not I'm not welcome here anymore. Yeah. I'm a go to America. <laughs> well, we don't want you either, bud. No, they took him. So uh. he actually attempted he actually attempted twice. Uh the first time he hopped on a on a ship, but the sailors recognized who he was and they threw him off uh, overboard. They were like, No, not on <laughs> not on this boat. You can't be here. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, uh and then he successfully hopped onto a ship to New York and he was uh, he was essentially banished from the UK. Yeah, New York will take anybody. Yeah. Uh, he, it was, uh, later found out he did marry, and he did have kids, and he had faded into obscurity, and, you know, if he was innocent, that's great. I'm glad that he could move on with his life, but if he was guilty, like, wow. What a way to go. What a way to go. 
Um, so yeah, so Mary Ashford's grave, I believe, is still in Erdington. Uh, and it's capped with something called a murder stone. What is that? Uh, so a murder stone is essentially, it's a grave header, um, but it's specifically intended to honor uh, victims of murder. Oh. Uh, so it has a little, little epitaph on it. And it reads, As a warning to female virtue and a humble monument to female chastity, this stone marks the grave of Mary Ashford, who, in her 20th year of her age, having incautiously repaired to a place of amusement, without proper protection, was brutally violated and murdered on May 27th, 1817. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, the Mary Ashford case remains unsolved to this day. Nobody other than Thornton has ever been tried with the murder. There's been no other suspects. It's <laughs> it just stands unsolved, and it's and it's still unsolved to this day. Naturally, it left a very deep scar on Erdington. Yeah. Yeah. Th- this was this was quite a shocker. I mean, like, if, it, it was, if it wasn't Thornton, I mean, there's still a killer walking around. Either way, it's pretty leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. It was. It, yeah, yeah. It was like like I said, this is like, this is a town just like any other. This doesn't happen in these sort of towns. So. Yeah, like people were just they were they were kind of left bamboozled. They were like, "Well, if it wasn't Thornton, there's a murderer, and if it was Thornton, he got away." So, who knows? Who knows what what he got up to? So, naturally, the events that happened 157 years later, oh, reopened a lot of old wounds. 157 years later? 157 years later. I said that this was two murders. I didn't expect them to be so far apart. I expected the same judges. I'm glad it's not the same judges. Not the same judges, but, I mean, it's not that much better. Oh, dear. So, this is where it starts to get a little bit, a little bit ooky, a little bit spooky. Oh, gosh. So, that's Mary, Mary Ashford. Now we're going to talk about the murder of Barbara Forrest, 157 years later in Erdington. Um... So once again, yeah, there's very little information on who Barbara was as a person, um... It's shocking that there's even less information on her than there was on Mary. Like, Mary's kind of got, like, the spectacle of the trial by combat kind of kept it going. Mm-hmm. Um, but Barbara, like, there's so little information on her. And because of what I'm about to talk about, it it all gets very muddy. So I I, I found what I could, but there's, there's not a lot on her, which is a big shame. Um, so we do know that she was born uh, either late... 1953 uh, or 19, uh, 1994 1954 sorry to parents Margaret and Gordon Forrest okay. and we do know that she had a sister named Erica hmm. a lot of my sources stated that Mary and Barbara had the same birthday which would make her birthday December 31st 1953 making her a Capricorn but I don't know this this wasn't in all of my sources I couldn't find it a bit with her birthday I'm not sure but okay. it's possible that their birthdays were the same interesting she was also devoutly Christian. Hmm. She had just turned 20, just like Mary Ashford, mm-hmm. uh, and she was at the time dating a man named Simon Belcher, who was 21 at the time. Okay. So, Barbara was currently working as a nurse in a local children's home. Um, she was kind of like, from what I could see, she was kind of like a social worker, uh, but she also helped take care of sick children. Um, And she was also the national secretary at the Lutheran Church Youth Movement, along with Simon. Um, Simon's father was the local minister at the time for Reddington. Mm. So all around, just a really sweet and nice girl. Yeah. And she's beautiful, too. She's a beautiful girl. You know, she's she's standing up for her community. She's taking care of children. You know, she's, you know, she's done nothing wrong in her life. She is, you know, she's literally like the poster child of living a good life. Wow. Just tell us about what's horrible is about to happen. Oh, yeah. So on May 26th, 1974. Does that date sound familiar? Yeah. The couple uh, attended a service, uh, and it was they actually led the service because um, Simon's father. Uh, I think he had to step away for the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, the two of them worked together, and they led the service on a day called Whit Monday. Sure enough, same day. Like I said before, Whit Monday changes based on the year. Mm-hmm. On these two particular years, it lined up on the exact same day. That's wild. May 26th. That's wild. Yeah. So, much like Mary Ashford and her uh, friend Hannah Cox, the two were going to go celebrate in Erdington, and they were actually going to go, I think, uh, a little bit out of town as well. Uh, and they were just going to go to a couple of pubs. They were going to dance the night away. It's thing to do. You know? You got to dance. Yeah. Um, it was reported earlier in the month before the murder, Barbara had been reported saying, 
this is going to be on my unlucky month. I just know it. Don't ask me why. I don't like that. So they both they both knew. Uh huh. They both knew. Um. So Bar- Barbara and some reported at several pubs along the way, and they had been seen dancing throughout the night. Um, their timeline is really, really unknown. I don't know which pub specifically they went to. I know that they were pub hopping. Um, I think it actually led them a little bit outside of uh, Erdington. They were not in Erdington at the time that they ended their evening, um, but they were coming back through to Erdington. Huh. Um, we do know that Simon walked Barbara to the bus stop at one in the morning of May 27th, 1974. Okay. So she's heading home on May 27th, 1974. Uh, and he left her at the bus stop. Like all good boyfriends uh, do. I mean, I, I, like he, if he lived locally, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what was going on. I don't know what was happening with Simon. You know, he might have, you know, something had happened. He might have been called to work. He might have had to go clean up. I don't know where he was going. I'm not going to blame him at all. There's no way he could have known. This is also I'm it's a blaming sleepy town. Simon. I'm <laughs> this blaming the, Simon. It's a sleepy town. There's no way like this doesn't like it happened to Mary Ashford 157 years ago. Like, think bad things don't really happen. So, uh, if all things had gone according to plan, it would have been a very quick bus ride back into Erdington, and then it would have been a 10 minute walk to get back home. Wow. Yeah. So that was kind of her her path through the night. She was going to get on this bus, get dropped off back in Erdington, t- 10 minute walk home. Yeah, and I'm sure there wasn't a lot of people on the bus back then. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about the bus in a little bit. After Simon dropped her off at 1 a.m., she disappeared. Of course. Yeah. Simon and her family didn't hear from her uh, after that night. She just kind of poof. Uh, and since, of course, the Monday was a holiday, nobody really suspected anything was amiss. Like, you know, she wasn't supposed to be at work. It's a, it's a religious holiday. Yeah. Like, she's just she's sleeping off her party. Um... It was the, the, the Tuesday she didn't work uh, show up for work. That was when the red flags were, were, were starting to sail. Yeah. Uh, and the children's home actually got in contact with the family, and they filed a missing persons report. Uh, it was on June 4th, several days later, that the body of a young woman was found. Oh, it was found in a sandy ditch in Pipe Hayes Park, Erdington. Oh, I just got chills. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Oh, that's eerie as hell. The body was covered, not with water, this time it was with Bracken, and trigger warning, she had been raped and then strangled. Wow. The body had been identified as 20-year-old Barbara Forrest. The body had been partially nude, just like Mary Ashford, and she was found 500 yards away from her home. Oh my god. She was also right next to her workplace in Erdington. Like, it was like right down the path. Yeah. And she was found 300 feet away from where Mary Ashford had been found 157 years before. Wow. That's unbelievable. That's so spooky. I I legit have chills right now. Like, that's... What are the odds? Just wait. Just wait. Oh, it gets worse. So the police speculated that the attacker had hidden amongst the trees in the park and waited for her to approach before sneaking up behind her and attacking. Wow. Okay. Yep. Um, do we uh, know for a fact where Thornton was 150 years later? You know, just wait. Just wait. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, I that. Yeah, so it's actually unknown if she caught that bus the night. Um, they actually went rounded up and they interviewed uh, passengers from that night and they claimed to have not seen her. Oh. But this also could have been unpredictable eyewitnesses. Like when you're like taking the bus late at night, you're not really looking at the people on the bus. Like, yeah, no, it's possible they just didn't see her or they weren't paying attention. They were distracted. Like, it could have been a number of things. Yeah, um, just because they didn't see her doesn't mean she wasn't there. Yeah, there's also a theory that she might have gotten a lift from a friend. So if she wasn't on the bus, maybe like somebody that she knew or recognized Drove saw by. her at the bus stop, and they were like, "Hey, I'll let me give you a lift back to Erdington." Uh, and then she got in the car. Oh, jeez. Uh, I mean, it was only 1 a.m. It, it was the night of a holiday, so, like, pe- things like things hadn't, like, quite... It wasn't, like, 4 a.m. with Ma- Mary Ashford. It was 1 a.m. So, like, people were still out in the streets. The party was still kind of going on. It was wrapping up for sure, but it was, like, you know... Yeah. Like, it's still a celebration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there had also been reports of a blue car sighted that night um, on the path she would have taken to come home through the park. So people were like maybe it was the blue car maybe it picked her up maybe it was following her maybe it was but there was like there was no nothing concrete to go off of yeah uh naturally public was outraged they were like whoa what this doesn't happen yeah not in our town 
No, and it's like Barbara, like we said earlier, she was literally like, she was the poster child of clean cut living. Like, she was she was beautiful, she was clean, she was you know devoutly religious, she was taking care of children, she was helping out the church. You know, she had a, a bright future ahead of her. She had a, you know a, a doting partner, and then just gone, just snuffed. Yeah, yeah, pretty much like all of those like those pieces together, they kind of just fanned like the fires of the public outrage and like like the Erdington Police Department needed to get on it. Uh, and they did. So more than a hundred detectives were part of this case. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the uh, the whole thing was spearheaded by Detective Superintendent Mick Lenahan. Mm. I hope I said your name right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they're still active. This was in the 70s after all. You did your best. Uh, as did I try. I, as we know, I'm alphabetically challenged and I cannot pronounce things for the life of me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the police got pretty involved. Um, they interviewed the pastors from the, the, the bus. They actually uh, went door to door in the neighborhood to ask if anyone had seen anything. Uh, the next stretch of road was Chester Road. Uh, they went door to door. They actually even held reconstructions of the crime, which I actually thought was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a young police officer named Linda Madison uh, posing as Barbara for the press, like so, she you know pretended to be the where the body was. You know, she walked along that path. You know, they took mm-hmm. a lot of pictures. She wore the clothes that Barbara would have been seen in. Oh wow! Not the actual clothes, but like you know, like dressed Similar. as if she was Barbara, and like try to recreate like how it could have gone down. So that it see if it jogged anybody's memories. Wow. Uh, the it was ruled that she had died on May twenty seventh, nineteen seventy four, hmm. same day as Mary. Yeah. The cause of death was ruled a strangulation, though. She did not drown. Okay. It was so wild that it was, like, the same. Yeah. Um, And it was only in September of that year that they made an arrest. Wow. Yeah. And who did they finally get for it? The man that they arrested was a man named Michael Ian Thornton. No way. No fucking way. Yeah. Any relation? I don't believe so. I don't believe that they were related because, of course, uh, the Abraham Thornton went to New York afterwards and he lived a life. It's possible that uh, one of his relatives did move back, but from what I could see, there was no relation. I mean, like, did he have, like, a brother that stayed in town? Mm. I don't believe so. I feel like the, the name of the, the, the that family of Thorntons were pretty, like... Yeah. They were pretty outcasts. I don't, That's I don't know. Wild. I don't believe they were related, but I'm not going to say that they weren't. It's possible, but I didn't find anything to say that they were. It's just a small town, interesting last name, specific. Yeah. But, like, how fucking wild, right? I don't like it. Yeah. I don't so like Michael, it. <laughs> Michael Thornton was 38 at the time, and he lived along the road that she was found. Of course. He was also a co-worker of Barbara at the children's home. Oh, okay, so he knew her. Someone she knew that she could have gotten in the car with. Yep. And said, oh yeah, we live right next to each other. Let me drive, yeah. you, let me drive you home. The police found blood stains on Thornton's pants. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. like the Abraham Thornton with the blood on his undergarments, he was mm-hmm. found blood stains on his pants. He told me they got this fucker this time, though. Hold on. Uh, they also, he claimed he had an alibi and his mother, like, backed it up. I don't know what it was. Whether he was hanging out with his mother the night before or if she just, like, yeah, he was doing that thing. <laughs> um, but it was proven false and it came out later that they both lied. Wow. So, Mama's boy yeah. getting lied for by your mama. Yeah. Do with that what you will. Yeah. Uh, so. Don't like it, Thornton. His alibi fell through, like, immediately. Like, it yeah. didn't even, didn't even hold up. Uh, That's sus. Yeah, but just like in Mary Ashford's trial, didn't exactly go in the favor of the prosecution. What? The uh, prosecuting lawyer even stated at the beginning of the trial that most of the evidence against Thornton was circumstantial. But I mean, uh, yeah, you're correct. <laughs> I can't argue with that. I have nothing to say to that. That is factual. Yeah. It's, yeah, there, there was nothing. It, it's all very suspicious, but there was nothing concrete. Uh, I don't like it. These Thorntons. Yeah, and it was actually on the seventh day of the trial that the judge turned to the jury and advised them not to take circumstantial evidence to heart and that he didn't think Thornton was guilty. Oh my gosh, these judges. Yeah, he advised the jury to hand out the verdict of not guilty. Whoa, lo and behold. They, 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 did, they did take longer than six minutes this time, but they did come back and were like, we don't think he did it. Surprise, surprise. 
surprise, it's a freaking prize. And while, while I do agree with, like, you know, they shouldn't take circumstantial evidence to heart, like you said, at the end of the day, you want a crime that is convicted solely upon, like, facts, and you want to make sure that it is it is true without beyond reasonable doubt. But mm-hmm. for a judge to specifically say, I don't think he's guilty, that's the extra step. Right, and the fact that it happened twice, yeah, 157 years apart, mm-hmm. it's like, ah! <laughs> Moderate your judges. Erdington. Oh my god. Get it together. Yeah. I don't know where sp- that this trial specifically took place. I don't know if it happened in Erdington or if it was in like a local town, but yeah. The fact that it happened twice, real fucking weird. Yeah. Yeah. And so it should be no surprise that everyone was pretty freaking outraged. They were like, what? Again? I can't believe this. When we specifically asked you not to? Yeah. So it should be no surprise that Barbara's older sister demanded answers. Older siblings stepping up. Your older sister, William? Oh, no, Erica. What's oh. her name? Well, close yeah, enough. Can you imagine? <laughs> Wilhelmina. No, Erica, uh, who's a badass. Um, she did not go as far as demanding trial by combat. That did not happen. I'm sorry. Uh, Thornton, Mike, uh, Michael Thornton was just like, I, you know, not feeling the trial by combat. I'm sorry. Not doing that. It was also, I think, illegal at the time. Um... But she has been, um, like, demanding answers for the past 40 years. Because this is unsolved. Still. Just like Mary's uh, case. 40 years, though. What a... 40 years it has been... I mean, I think Mary's case has been uh, unsolved for 190, like, nearly 200 years. Probably 200 years at this point. Jeez. Uh, So, yeah. So Eric has been, like we need to get this case reopened. They need to relook at DNA evidence because now, like, back in the 70s, that wasn't a thing. But yeah. now we have all this technology. Yeah, we got all sorts of DNA evidence. Yeah, it's, it was actually in 2012, specifically 40 years later, that Eric, uh, Erica demanded that they reopen the cold case back up and retest all the samples they took. She, like, remembered specifically they took a bunch of samples. You know, they had the, the pants with the blood on it. Uh, of course, you know, uh, um, Barbara's body was uh, pretty decomposed at the time, but maybe they took a rape kit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the spokesperson from the police department stated that there were no further forensic opportunities to explore. Meaning they did not have the evidence available, I'm assuming. I, I don't know what it means specifically, but it pretty much sounds like the department either lost or destroyed the samples. Yeah. That is some bullshit. So yeah, so chances are department lost or accidentally destroyed samples. It's not great. They even had uh, other police departments go on, you know, it doesn't look good. Yeah. Um, the family of Barbara also requested to get Barbara's personal belongings back because, of course, it's been 40 years and, you know, like, if there are no further forensic opportunities to explore, like, they at least have their stuff back. Um, I think they specifically requested some sentimental jewelry that she had. Yeah. Um, they were gifted to her by her godparents and they wanted her handbag back, you know, for phone, wallet, you know, something, something to have that belonged to her. Yeah. Uh, police departments ignored the requests. Wow. Yeah. Um, the family actually got... A, sorry, yes? Oh, I'm assuming, again, just because they lost these things? Well, they they got a newspaper. They, the, the family reached out to a newspaper like, hey, like we're not getting any answers. They're ignoring us. Like, Is there anything you guys can do? Uh, so the newspaper actually reached out on the family's um, behalf to this uh, police department. They were like, hey, like, where's their stuff? Yeah. Uh, the police said that they could neither confirm nor deny that the belongings had been misplaced. Yep. Okay. Yeah, real good. We can't. We can't. We can't. One hundred percent tell you, but we definitely, for sure, a hundred percent have lost the items in question. But, but like, it's your one. It's one job. Like, hold on to the evidence. Like, that's the one thing you shouldn't misplace. <laughs> yeah, like you said, it, if you couldn't solve the whole thing, like at least you hang on to the evidence. But <sighs> can't even do like, that. Forget. What? What happened to? What happened? Like, how did it get lost? How did how did the samples get destroyed? Where where is her stuff? Like, what? Like, did you guys move? Was there like a move that you like went from one office to the other, and they were like, ah, shit, we left it in the moving truck, and we'll never see it again? Like, what happened? It really does make you wonder. Like you said, what what could have happened? Like, did did, did you just like I don't know? Your kids came over, and your wife's like, oh, look at this pretty jewelry, and you're like, yeah, they're never gonna need it. You can just take that. Like, I just, it really makes you wonder, like, what what actually could happen to these items? Or were things just, like, kept in such a way that, like, they weren't labeled? And then all of a sudden, so there is just this box of, like, oh, yeah, we don't know what that stuff is. Does someone get rid of it? Like, I, I don't know. And, and, and we'll, we'll never know. And that's, it sucks because, like, 
that stuff could have solved her murder, you know, 40 years down the line. There could have been anything on her jewelry, on her handbag, on her, on her clothes. And it's anything. happened. It's happened. We've seen it with cases where, you know, the 40-year-old cases are not that old comparatively. And the I mean, people are no. still alive as long as, as long as there's evidence, like you said, to, with something. A trace evidence of something. I mean, but if you, like, think about Barbara's parents, like, I think her, when I read her father is in, like, his 80s. Like, and it's like, are they, they might pass away not ever knowing what happened to their daughter. And it's and it sucks and it's horrible. And, and but like, you also see what, what immediately comes to mind is like the West Memphis Three. And there's like that whole debacle going on right now where um, the police department there is like, oh, sorry, there was a fire and it destroyed all the evidence. Yeah. And then a lawyer went down a couple days later and he was like, no, it's right here. I can see it on the table. Wow. And they were like, it's not there. And they're like, no, it's literally right here. I've, I have a picture and I've sent it to everyone. Wow. And, yeah. And, they're, and they've been denying they, they've had this evidence for years, but it's actually just been in the back this whole time. They claimed there was a fire and there was no record of a fire. Why would they cover it up? Oh, well, we'll, we'll talk about that if we ever talk about the West Memphis Ray, which whew, that is a that is a tough case. And now we need to. Now we need to. But uh, that's we'll save that for our, our like seven part spectacular because that, that's a lot of information it's a lot of horrible information yeah, and, I don't know oof. if I know about it you don't know oh well ma'am like if that one's worth that one's worth a whole fucking shelf in the spookery well one day yeah. we will get to it we will we'll, we will and hopefully by the time we get to it there will finally be a conclusion because like things have been happening yeah. the wheels are moving like now they know that the evidence is there they just need the go ahead to just test it there's been a lot of uh a lot of movement on some old cases lately. There was a, the other, um, the Indiana case, where the girls had a photo of uh, someone in the background, and someone was just finally arrested in that. Oh yeah, the Delphi murders. Oh, the Del- thats what it is called. Yes. The I Del- yes, they finally they've arrested someone. I'm so excited to see what comes out of that because like, I need justice, man. Like these, all these people need justice. They do. It's it's so unfortunate when you see these cases that. Uh, just have no no resolution the families have no con- like actual closure on the situation yeah and you just want it for them more than anything and mm-hmm. you, that's that is one one thing I, I think my hope with spookery and with everything the more that we do talk about these things like you said and, and kind of give you know life to the the victims in a way of just talking to them and sharing their stories because that's really all we can do hopefully maybe one day the more that you do talk about it the, the, an answer will arise no, a hundred percent. Like the more you talk about a case, the more people know about it, and then the more people who know about it, the more like people are gonna ask for something to be done. Yep. And and it, you know, all you can do is you just spread correct information. You spread the truth. Don't spread lies because that that defeats the purpose as well. Don't don't sensationalize anything, but keep telling the stories of these people because true crime is always true to somebody. Like these are true stories to somebody. They're not, you know, just, they're, they're fun stories for us to talk about, but they are real. And it's it's good to just make sure that they, they stay alive, even if it's just in our memories. That's true. A hundred percent. I agree with you as well. Yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, that's how the Erdington murders end. Uh, both cases are still unsolved to this day. Once, you know, 200 years later, this one, uh, Barbara's is like, what, 50 years now? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they're both uh, unsolved, but neither case is closed. Hmm. So, so there's still hope. There, there's still there's still hope for both of these lovely uh, lovely ladies. Hopefully, we can get some justice for them. Uh, but as of right now, the Erdington murders slash Erdington coincidences are unsolved. Wow. So let's recap on the similarities because this is what I thought about telling you at the beginning, and I was like, nah, I'm just gonna hold on to this. <laughs> so, both victims were twenty year old women. Uh, According to some sources, they had the same birthday, December 31st. Uh, they both spent their last nights dancing. Uh, both left the party with, an, uh, with a man. With a man's. With a man's. Uh, they were both devoutly religious, and it was actually, you know, specifically in their descriptions, devoutly religious. Mm-hmm. Both were murdered on May 27th in practically the same spot, 300 feet away from each other. Yeah. Both in a sandpit uh, the morning after a religious holiday with Monday. Uh, both women were found partially nude. Both were suspected to be committed by a man named Thornton, and both were raped and strangled, then left to die. Um, 
Both Thorntons were found with blood on their clothes. Both had very strange alibis that were proven to be kind of shaky. Uh, and both Thorntons were acquitted. <laughs> Judges in both cases were like, we don't think he's guilty. Uh, both victims also had those eerily similar remarks right before their deaths. And of course, both cases are unsolved. That is... Truly, it, it is it is crazy to have such similar cases, 150 years apart, in almost the same exact spot. It just right. What same are the town, odds? same spot. The fact that the suspects had the same last name, like, yeah. what are the freaking chances? And in both cases, uh, they were both the only people to ever be tried for the murder. Like, there were never any other suspects other than the Thorntons in both cases. Yeah, that is really wild, too, because usually there's at least someone else that they could go, well, if it wasn't this guy, it had to be this guy. And there just wasn't. There was nothing. No. And, you know, especially in Barbara's case, it, like, suspicion never fell upon the boyfriend. He was never even considered a suspect. Um, he, he had nothing to do with it. Yeah. He put her on that yeah. bus, you know, left her there and wished her the best. Yeah. So... That is, uh, that is the story of Mary Ashford and Barbara Forrest. Uh, hopefully one day we can get some answers. But that's it. That's the Ertington Coincidences, and I hope you guys enjoyed this what-the-fuck case of mine. Yeah, those, those really are. That's a what-the-fuck, like you said, just uh, <laughs> crazy, crazy coincidences. Who would have thought? I just, uh... Right? And yeah, I I had quite a few I wanted to pick from, and this is the one that made my dad's eyebrows go whoa. So I'm like, okay, this is the one we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but man, like, whew, huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate you coming with such a interesting case, ready to present, sharing this with me because this is something I had never heard about. So even just getting to explore a new case and a new set of circumstances, as you put it, that's I think a, a really good instead of just the Ernington murders, the, even the Ernington circumstances. Very Oh yeah, the coincidences. Coincidences. The, co the coincidences. And that's what they are. It's just a whole heck of a lot of coincidences. Yeah, and like, and that's the thing to remember. They're not related in any way, shape, or form. They're not connected. There's no, nothing to do with each other. It's just this eerie, eerie strain of strange happenstances that just yeah. happen to mirror each other. Huh. Yeah. It really makes you wonder, There's because, I mean, even with the last ones we did, the fires, like, those were all very similar, um, yet very different at the same time. Oh, that was a thing I forgot to tell you at the beginning of the episode. Uh, I actually had another addition to your fire episode uh, from my trip to, to Salem. Oh, really? There was a spooky fire! Wow, I need to hear all about that. Uh, the ropes uh, manor in Salem, there was a, a woman who uh, burned to death inside the ropes manor abigail ropes oh and after after her death it was a, uh, a long string of like unexplained fires that all started in the same room the day that uh where she caught fire wow okay yeah it was yeah it was like and i, I was when i was there listening to the story i was like huh yeah there's another one <laughs> well we need to add that to the spookery eventually too one day yeah oh i'd love to do a whole like Salem Stories episode, but alas, the wheel decides my fortune. It's true. We are we are just pawns in the bigger scheme of things. In this game. Oh yes, this this the spookery wheel, the wheel of fortuna, fortuna. Uh, filled with very spooky topics. So I guess it's that portion of the episode where I uh, I spin the big wheel. It sure is, buddy. So we gotta oh. take out, gotta walk over to the wheel, take out our two categories. Gotta take yes. out. Uh, Take what out the, cults. Yeah, with cults and what the fuck cases. Yep. There they go. Perfect. So, let's do it. Spin. Oh, God. <laughs> I always get so nervous at this part. I'm like, oh. I'm so excited. Oh. <laughs> oh. And? Okay. Drum roll. My category is theft and fraud. Ooh. That'll be interesting. That is... I, I don't have one for this. I don't think I do. Real, so this one, this is like one of the only categories I feel like that you don't have a preloaded case. It really is. I'm going to have to like really dig deep for this one. I don't think I have something that I know off the top of my head that's theft and fraud. Okay. Challenge accepted. All right. Spooky theft and fraud. 
Theft and fraud. That is going to be really interesting. I, I can't wait to hear what you come up with. Yeah, I will. Um, I will have about of a week a week length of panic, and then I'll be like, I gotta pick something. Yeah, that's uh, basically what I've been doing. I had my week long of, of panic, and now I'm like, all right, cool. I have my like top three cults, and I'm I'm ready to pick, and I'm super excited to dive in Ooh. and share it with you next week. Do you want to give us a teaser of uh, your your top pick for now, or uh, maybe I, your top three picks? I don't. Do you want to do you want to torment with us with something? There. <laughs> The one that I really want to do is is kind of like, you know, we don't we don't judge fetishes in this house, but it's kind of really feet related. And I'm oh, just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's, it was just really intriguing to me. I don't know if I can make it into a full episode though. That's but I, I'm sure I could. I'm you know, sure I could. that's not what I thought you were gonna do, but I'm really glad that you teased me with that one because um, I'm now gonna wait in suspense for the possibility that one day I'm gonna hear about a feet cult. Yeah, you know, it they they exist. You just no, you just I'm sure it. they do, and you know what? It's valid, but uh, don't ask me to get involved. You know, I'll, I'll I'll make sure the invitation is nice and pretty. It might sway you. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I'm good. Hey, don't argue. You keep you try it. Nah, I'm good. You don't know what we do. You don't know what kind of food we serve. Uh, on your feet? I never specified. <laughs> podcast over <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the spooker everybody and alana and i never spoke again after this day <laughs> oh. it all ended on the erdington murders three episodes was pretty good yeah no i'm no matter what you pick whether it it, it ends up being this one or another <laughs> one or ends up being two cults i'm very excited to hear what you have to say because i freaking love cults because they're bizarre and full of full of just I don't know. I almost said bizarreness again. That's not correct. Wackiness. Uh, Kookiness. Craziness. Yeah. Spookiness. Spookiness. Yes. And that's why they belong on our shelf. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to add an addition next week. Thank you so much for your lovely case this week. Both of your cases. I love that we've been getting, you know, we have (laughs) these categories. Last week we got three. (laughs) This week we got two. It's been, I think it's been going really well. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm excited to, uh, I'm excited to keep going. And uh, maybe, who knows, maybe my theft and fraud will end up being uh, a two-parter as well. Yeah, some of the categories just call for that. There's some that, you know, by themselves, they're pretty interesting. But together, you're just like, oh, bam. Wowza. Wowza. Specifically that, in quotes, wowza. Wowza. That's, you know, I heard, I think, both of the people in Erdington, um, both of the investigators, top investigators, that's like their main quote is wowza. Yeah. I read that. They were like, there's a strange coincidence of between 157 years apart. Wowza. Yeah. It's crazy that the first guy even said it because he didn't know that the next murder was even going to happen. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty yeah. wild. Yeah. He went he went and uh, ch- chatted with the Norwegian board and they were like, hey, something weird's going to happen in 157 years. You don't have to worry, but it's going to be pretty wild. And he yeah. was like, wowza. Wowza. Yep. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> don't look it up. Uh, don't No, it's... Uh, <laughs> That's what, this is where the facts end. <laughs> True facts, TM. <laughs> yes, the, 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 the facts ended when I said unsolved. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, man. Right, uh, anything you would like to plug? Uh, not, ma'am, nope. Just uh, this wonderful podcast. This is the only thing I got going on. It's my pride and joy. I'm so happy to be doing it with you. Keep listening to oh, it, people. I... If you made it this far, we appreciate you. Yes, if you did make it this far and you've enjoyed the last three episodes, I will say please consider leaving a review. Please give us a star rating. Uh, leave a nice message. Uh, don't shout at us, please. We're very sensitive. But yeah, if you consider, if you like it, uh, please consider leaving a review. It helps us get seen. It helps spread the awareness of the podcast. And we'll love you for it. And maybe if we get some fun ones, maybe we'll read them out loud. Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the meanwhile, you can find us at Spooky Podcast on Twitter. Uh, Spookery Podcast on Instagram, and you can send us a Gmail at spookerypodcast at gmail.com. Uh, send your stories, send your corrections nicely. <laughs> nicely. <laughs> nicely. We're, se- we're sensitive. Yes. Yeah, we are sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, send your stories, send, send your folklore, send any suggestions you would like. Just make sure that you, uh, in the subject line, you specify what your is. If you're sending advice, I know I can put them in the folder and cry about it when I read them. <laughs> <laughs> if it's just yeah, uh, if it's just corrections, yeah. then we know, and we can be like, "Oh shoot, hey guys, we uh, made a little mistake." Yeah. Whoops. Whoops. My bad. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. You know, nobody's perfect. I gotta work it <laughs> again and again until I get it right. 
and with that Hannah Montana quote we are (laughs) out of here everybody thank you so much for listening to the third episode of Spookery yes uh yeah keep going I was just gonna say keep it spooky keep it spooky (laughs) I'm gonna impart my wisdom that I learned on my time at Boston the best advice I've ever gotten stay vertical everybody it's a good one I like that yeah stay vertical stay spooky adapt yeah apps (laughs) (laughs) goodbye everybody (laughs) goodbye goodbye Oh boy, she going. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh boy, she going. Oh boy, she going. She's going. She she sure is. There she goes. Oh god, where's she going? Where is she going? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> and no one's gonna stop her. <laughs> we let her do it. Okay. Yeah. She's gotta let her go. <laughs> All right. <laughs>